and research for the Cardinal Institute of West Virginia. She was raised in Pinch, West Virginia, graduated from WVU in 2011 with a bachelor's degree in economics and a minor in Spanish and received both her master's and Ph.D. in economics from George Mason University, which puts her as the smartest person in the room, with the exception of the admiral, who also has a doctorate degree, too. Uh, he doesn't talk but, about but, it a lot. But not in economics? Not in economics. Yeah. He, he, his is in uh, seafaring ways. Oceanography. Oceanography. Yeah. Jesse, good morning. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. It's a pleasure to join you all so close to Christmas. It's great to have you with us. And uh, would you prefer to be called uh, Doctor or Jesse? We'll just go with Jesse. Does right. there need to be extra formal? We can do that. Uh, the uh, report, Benefit Cliffs and Disincentives to Work in West Virginia, uh, authored by you, Director of Policy and Research, deals with what happens to an individual in West Virginia if you earn too much money but not quite enough to make a decent living. Uh, the fact that you, uh, for the most part, kind of fall off the benefit cliff. Can you give us some details about that? Sure thing. So let's start with the big picture here. In America, the way that we have addressed the needs of our fellow citizens in poverty, we have made poverty survivable but not escapable. And that remains true in West Virginia. For the average person that is receiving some assistance, and that's going to be a single mom with two kids, at the lowest levels of income, she's eligible to receive across all these different programs up to $45,000 worth of support in material goods and services. Um, and as she begins to earn income, between wages and the support that she's getting, she kind of tops out at around $30,000 in wages and between the two, receiving about $75,000 worth of material goods in that. And afterwards, because of these benefit cliffs where you have a sharp decline in the assistance that you're getting as a result of small wages, she is not going to reach that same level of material well-being for herself and for her family until she's earning more than $75,000. Again, so that's a huge gap, and that creates a, a massive disincentive for individuals in those positions to really strive for more and really feel like they're able to chase their version of the American dream. Jesse, what is the solution to the problem? Have you proposed one? So there are a lot of things that could be done for this. We've identified three things that we think would move the ball in the right direction. And first of these is just a comprehensive review of all of these different programs that are set up to help people. We want to take a closer look at that on a regular basis. Are they doing what they have intended to do? The second one of these solutions that we've talked about, it's a grace period. We're thinking 30 to 90 days. That there's kind of a delay before that drop off or that hit happens and that cliff takes effect um, in the absence of you know, a, a reform to the structure. And the way that we think about that is, you know, if you start a new job, maybe it takes 90 days for your health insurance benefits to kick in. And if you're, living on the razor's edge, that's going to be a difficult choice to make. And with this 90-day period, then you can bridge that gap. And the final thing that we've looked at is what's, what we're calling a one-door policy, so that we have individuals that they can go strictly to one place to get the material support that they need in their challenging time, as well as getting the assistance that they need to kind of re-engage and better match their skills with the workforce and really be able to, like I said, be on the pathway to building that version of their American dream. Bill? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Jesse, but I did not follow what you said. I, I've, I've been reading along. The $30,000 is um, there's a gap of that. If you got $75,000, there's a bridge. 
couple these things together, couple these points together. Uh, are they are these federal incentives uh, or state? What what influence does the state have to rectify the problem? And exactly what is the problem? So the the core piece of this problem, I would say, is that all of these different programs that are meant to help people out, they were designed with sort of a laser focus, meeting one particular need. Um, And as they have all combined together and created this convoluted apparatus of assistance, it creates these cliffs, it creates these disincentives, um, and it it has created the, the proverbial rock in a hard place where individuals have to make this decision between climbing further in their careers, bettering their professional lives, or kind of opt into that professional stagnation in order to maintain the standard of living that they have for themselves and their families. Is this an academic discussion, or is this a practical uh, discussion? A little bit of both. To be perfectly honest, there is a lot of this that I think the way that requirements are imposed kind of from the federal government where they are, where these federal agencies are the ones driving the requirements and the mandates in these programs. But there is some progress being made that Congress is looking at some ideas so that options like this one door policy can be implemented where we get rid of individuals having to go to a bunch of different places and get disjointed pieces of help and into a system where they can deal with, you know, one individual, one agency that is looking at their comprehensive situation and saying, okay, how can we help you bridge this gap in your current difficult situation? and help you position yourself to be able to stand on your own two feet and go forward and be more than you thought you ever could. Well, that's all commendable, but isn't that more government involvement? More bureaucracy? I would categorize that as a rethinking of it. And actually, if we are in a situation where everything kind of is integrated together instead of having a bunch of different agencies and one smarter agency, I would argue that that is, it's still government, but there's less of it and the incentives are better aligned. John Gilstrap. Um, <clears throat> just to make sure the definition of terms, I understand what we're talking about. When you say material support, what does that mean? That is going to mean things like food assistance, like having Medicaid coverage or the CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program that subsidizes your health insurance for your child or child care uh, subsidies. So those different pieces of it and the sort of the, the fair market value of those programs, that is what I'm meaning when I say in terms of material support. Okay, so what we're, I think I'm, I'm getting lost in this. Are you saying that people are encouraged to not take a $74,000 a year job because you're going to lose free stuff? What I am pointing out is that around the $30,000 mark, that is the first time that they face that decision of do I continue to advance myself or do I stagnate out and maintain the security that I have uh, with, with the support that I'm getting? Because well, that is, for this situation, that's the, the first place that one of these cliffs would occur. I'm, I'm looking at your website, not your website, the uh, uh, press release that was put out that you sent on to Rob. It says this, they do not regain the same level of material well-being until they can earn more than $75,000 annually. So I guess my question to you is, are you suggesting that somebody who is earning 
$30,000 and getting the government assistance is, is better off than the person who doesn't get government assistance and is earning $75,000 a year. Looking at it from just purely the numbers, purely the material support, if you're looking at it just along that dimension, that, that is true. But on the flip side of that, we have these, uh, these kind of intangible benefits of working and having that dignity of earned success, that feeling of satisfaction about a job well done, feeling needed and valued by your community and not having to rely on someone else or some other entity to meet your own needs. Well, we kind of test drove that during the COVID years. We paid a lot of people a lot of money to stay home, and it took us years to recover from that in the job market to getting people to, you know, go back to the the um, service sector jobs, waiters and, and what have you, because as a practical matter, they were earning more off of the COVID money than otherwise. So I guess my question here is the underlying argument that we should have less government assistance and therefore incentivize people to go to work earlier rather than holding out? What we really need to be thinking about in terms of how we're helping our fellow neighbors and what we are doing to help those among us who are facing challenging situations as a society, as a government, as everything, we need to be in a scenario where work pays off. Um, and I think that like you've discussed here in the, in the COVID era, we, Policies were enacted with good intentions that made it such that work didn't pay off. Um, and we're, we're seeing the effects of that. And I think we see the effects of that in, in these assistance systems. So you know, when we break the, sorry. Um, so when we break that relationship between the work that you're doing and, you know, being able to improve your own situation, then we create these disincentives for people to re-engage with the workforce, uh, to re-engage with work overall, and to really find their own sense of deeper pride, purpose, and meaning. I think some of the points Jesse is trying to make are getting lost, John. Um, and I think what what here, here's how I understand what Jesse is saying with this report. If you are in her particular situation, she used a single mom making about ten and a half bucks an hour with two kids, five and two. And at that wage, at that wage, the doors open up at various levels for assistance, whether it's for food assistance, earned income tax credits, uh, heating assistance, whatever you name it, rent assistance. It's there for a person making twenty something thousand dollars up to about thirty. Uh, once you get past 30, let's say that that same mom now got a job and she was offered $40,000 a year. Most of these benefits evaporate and go away at that wage. Now, can you live in Berkeley County, West Virginia on $40,000 a year with two kids? Uh, there are people doing it. But that same person's assistance and earnings power grew to $75,000 a year at a $20,000 income because of all the assistance that is open to that person. So is that person likely to accept a job at thirty-five dollars or $40,000 a year knowing that all of the other benefits and assistance and aid available to that person will now go away? So the way the system is set up now, it does seem to dis de uh, disincentivize a person to take a better job because you lose your health care benefits if the, if the place you're working for isn't going to pay for them. Uh, you're going to lose your heating assistance, your rent assistance, your, your food benefits. And, and I go back to when I was in college, I worked for a swimming pool company, sunken swimming pools. And there was a fellow there. This is back in the era in Pittsburgh where all the steel mills were closing. As he had gotten laid off, right? His mill was eventually going to close, but he had gotten laid off and he was getting unemployment. And he was allowed to earn certain amount of money on unemployment. Anything over than that would affect his unemployment. So he worked for under the table cash, right? The guy paid him cash. So what does that do? Well, it, one, it cheats the system because you're not paying tax on your cash that you made, right? And this rule that was put in place disincentivized him to actually work legitimately and get a job that paid better than the unemployment benefits. 
So th- these these disincentives do exist. They have for a long time, and they should be addressed in some form. Jesse, is is the is the uh, is the address of this to uh, sort of shave them out over a longer course and period of time? I think with that you're going to run into some some fiscal challenges, kind of at scale with that. Um, now that said. A lot of these programs, they were designed to have exit ramps. They were designed to have that ease off and to initially have that state where it's not creating this scenario where you're not, where that disconnect between your work and your earning, or your work and your income occurs. Um, but then as more and more programs were devised, to meet more and more needs that people were encountering. But then the different qualifications in your eligibility or how your assistance amounts were calculated. Then along the way, as, as this, I hesitate to call it a system because that to me means that all the parts are working together. But as this assistance apparatus was built out, it's been kind of a Frankenstein's monster that you've got all of these different pieces together, but they are not working in concert to position the individual who is relying on them to to be able to, to get to a place where they can rise and stand on their own two feet and be able to call their own shots in their life. Bill? Yeah, I'm I'm coming back to the point that I raised earlier. I this this reads to me like a a very nice academic uh, uh, treatment or or examination, and I applaud that. I'm having trouble seeing the practical aspect though. And so you you said that there there's some move afoot to try to centralize. Uh, what do you anticipate is going to be coming out of this very well? developed academic uh, uh, piece? The, the biggest part of it in this moment is the discussions like what we're having right now and understanding the scope of what these disincentives are, what these gaps are, and how the, this assistance apparatus has created so many different forks in the road where individuals make a rational decision to choose lo- to to do less in the workforce uh, because the the material needs of themselves and their family will be better met but, if they kind of hang back on that because don't, I don't think that there is I don't think there's enough of a widespread knowledge of how big these gaps are. Like when your co-host was talking about the the example up in Pittsburgh, I think a lot of people kind of know one of those stories or know somebody who knows somebody with that. But to see it laid out in the black and white and have the numbers, have the break even wages um, brought to the forefront, that I think that helps everybody to think about better ways that we can, you know, give our fellow West Virginians the help that they need in a hard time and also for the the people who are running these assistance programs to devise a better system in that and also too for employers to understand like at what point are their employees going to reach that decision uh, this is John again about a minute and a half left John. okay I don't I don't have the vocabulary to 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 put this in into anything but sort of blunt terms that the bottom line in all of this is that we're talking about taxpayer charity so people who are making the sixty thousand dollars a year who aren't getting the seventy five thousand dollars worth of of uh, material support are paying for the the people who are are not doing that so you know if we correct for the indigent and the and the unwell and for, for that those that category of of folks who truly need the help it seems to me we're transitioning into the era of people who are gaming the system and i i find that 
bothersome. Well, that system already exists. Yeah. I know it, it is. It's the purpose of the report. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, if, uh, about 30 seconds, where can our listeners and viewers find this report? You can check it, this out at cardinalinstitute.com, and if you click on the research tab, it will be the first report that comes up. So again, cardinalinstitute.com, and click on the research tab. Hey, thank you so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful holiday season. You, you too. too.